So what you are going to hear is uh, my presentation is mostly my uh, hurt, my uh, let's say disappointments. A person who tried to imagine that it must have produced architects and engineers uh, competent to deal with the kind of problems that we faced, and we suddenly realized that bullet points. And those points are actually trying to respond to three, uh, three sub-questions uh, Biris had uh, passed on, and which is there in the program slip also. So I'm just uh, trying to see that. And uh, I think this is kind of a historical consideration of what happened after the earthquake. And uh, this is uh, experiential, oh, and also earthquake happened, and I'm talking about heritage, and, uh, the limitation is I'm talking about heritage of Kathmandu. And so the first uh, uh, damage that the earthquake did was to the identity of Nepal. And that was felt very strongly by the Nepalese for some reason. Politicians, ordinary people, everyone felt that uh, the identity had been attacked by the earthquake and we got to do something about it. But this identity soon, I think, took some political colors because this is an issue of national identity, a regional identity or community identity, and also a question of local identities. And the kind of divided society we are, and we have to be, I think, frank when we start this discussion, that we have to be able to bring out some of the things which are, we're keeping at the back and not uh, that will also brought about the damage as much as the earthquake did. The other thing the earthquake did was uh, the damage to our economy, which uh, I think the government was very uh, quick to realize. Like what you did was you destroyed them much further. All the, what you call the dozers and bulldozers went in. The, one of the things uh, that uh, I think that something good that happened in Nepal was uh, this, the word that is, UNESCO dangled a kind of a threat to Nepal immediately after the earthquake, that you might be put into the list of danger. This was done in June of that year. So when they did that, they talked about two things that there was a assessed damage or assessed threat to the heritage and there was a big potential threat to the heritage. That heritage had actually was still being threatened by reconstruction. That reconstruction, the way we were doing, was a bigger threat to the heritage of Nepal than the earthquake that had just gone past. So that, I think, tells us a lot about how the heritage um, management uh, um, uh, kind of uh, uh, did not help the situation. So there was a great concern for disaster management and safety, not so much for heritage. So heritage was kind of seen as something which is going to cause more disasters, that it is going to fall down and hit some man walking on the street, so you got to pull down your uh, heritage. So the, I, I remember there was a hue and cry about why Pratapur in Shambhu City pulled down. Because they said that this Guna is coming and we have to go around and this is going to come down. So this kind of, uh, uh, you know, side, side of, as long as it's not your house, you are willing to pull down anything. That kind of attitude uh, led. So the debris and dozers is another thing that killed us. So we, because this went into the disaster management and the international disaster management, the first thing they think of is to remove the debris. And the heritage became a debris. And we just uh, used our bulldozers to carry the debris and throw it away. So that also was a huge, uh, let's say, issue to us. We remember Kanak and myself, uh, I think it was uh, probably just uh, four, uh, four, seven days after the earthquake, we had to and uh, we organized a meeting with the army, uh, the chief of the army, to see what are you doing with this heritage site, that you should do something 
uh, different. The other syndrome that uh, kind of uh, damaged uh, or uh, kind of uh, further caused further damage was what I call the syndrome of earthquake resistance. So the first conclusion those who knew seemed to make that Nepalese architecture was not earthquake resistant. And this had to be built. And this had to be built in such a way that the great, great earthquake that Kanak and everyone else is expecting will come and we have to build as if that earthquake can come and go. That our buildings will stay. I think this will tell what we have done. But this, uh, this syndrome also. And this, we have many experts who swarmed into Nepal. And they were actually learners. They were trying to learn about earthquakes. But they became experts for us. And somebody who was doing a PhD in some university in Tokyo became the advisor to your NRA. And he said, <laughs> Mark, break, wood, ban this. <laughs> and the amazing thing about this is not so much the export himself, but the people, our leaders, who kind of use the mic the next day to say the same thing. <laughs> so that, that is the kind of uh, issues I think we, we face. And I think one of the worst things that, that happened to the heritage of Nepal was the self duplicating stance of Nepalese mm -hmm. technical manpower. But we were the first ones to come and say, look, this is such a terrible heritage. That it's weak. And if you read the statements of many engineers, you will find. It, it is not so much that uh, those uh, uh, little experts or big experts coming from international who actually did this. Our own people, our own people who are heading our departments, the CLBIU and th things like that, they are the ones who actually uh, <coughs> kind of de demeaned our own heritage. The heritage is something that should be appreciated. If it's a heritage, it should be appreciated. There's no demeaning of it. If you have a mud house as a heritage, that mud house should be great. That should be lovable because that's what identifies you. So you can't say, oh, what a terrible heritage I have. This great grandfather put a mud house for me. <laughs> and the whole world thinks it's a great house. And I have to make it earthquake resistant to nine Richter scale or whatever. And it's an amazing kind of deprecation of yourself. And this happened. So this shows that whether as educated people who really understood what heritage means or what our identity means, we thought that the identity of a Nepalese was to that Nepalese on the street and not to the Nepali on the decision making table. He was an educated man, expert, those who, who had seen the world and how things to be done. And so he made the decision the best for us. And that was most damaging to us, I think. <clears throat> so I, I find the engineers at that time were the most people who uh, depreciated our heritage most. I have a saying that the engineers went for an overkill of Nepalese heritage using the thanks to one of our friends sitting in the audience. This is supposed to be modern earthquake engineering knowledge. So this was nothing to do with the experiential knowledge of Nepal. Nepalese did not have any experience. They were just like fools living here for thousands of years in a ground that was being rocked all the time, but they went on building like this. So they deserve to be killed unless you want to ensure the safety of the international courts. <clears throat> so another thing I think, the architects were kept at a bay with this. It's not, Kanak was saying, why architects did not get involved. If I look at the beginning of the first three months of what was happening in, the, uh, in Kathmandu, we will find a deliberate attempt to keep the architects out. That this is an engineering problem. And the question of housing reconstruction, rural reconstruction, I think that dominated. And we'll come to that, that one of the bad, uh, uh, let's say, worst things that could happen to us that heritage was in the PDNA list. 
So uh, the other uh, politics was heritage of uh, uh, procurement of reconstruction. How do you, so people used a lot of things that no contractors, <laughs> because contractors are the culprits, because they are bent on destroying your heritage for profit, as if the rest of the people are not, as if the boss is not. You know, so, so this uh, issue was raised because among it, it helps a lot of people. And non, uh, use of non, uh, uh, let's say, non tender procurement processes, it has got its own. It, it lets many people charge many things. And if we look at some of the finances of the last three years of some of the people who are working on heritage, you will see how much of money the contractor might have made or how actually uh, the <coughs> contract procurement uh, was also used as a ploy to keep your heritage unpaid for a long time. That's what I think happened. Because they would have been ways to use that procurement process to get our heritage back and foot in some other ways. <coughs> so other uh, main issue was whose heritage is it? What? How something becomes our heritage? Is it, is it because who built it? It's our heritage because our ancestors built it? And how do we rebuild our heritage? The buildings built by our ancestors should be rebuilt by us? Would that make us a heritage? So that being rebuilt for us as heritage, then uh, who should rebuild is a big question. And uh, because uh, I think heritage became uh, chapter 6 of our TDNA social sector, then it was a big power. Or because he will probably give you for food, he will probably not give you for your luxury of heritage. So when you get it, you should know that they all wanted a, a coat hanger in Anwandoka. So we have the, they are all flocking to Anwandoka. The Chinese are flocking, the Americans are flocking, the Japanese are flocking, the Indians came and gave a look. And so if they don't get it in Anwandoka, they don't do it. So you see the politics of it. It is not for your good. It is for their own political image that they are coming and doing your so visibility, political visibility was what their objective is. So we often think that the Nepal's big challenge was this uh, scale of massive rebuilding. I don't think this was the uh, major challenge. The scale of rebuilding and reconstruction was also, uh, in, in uh, housing was also quite big. And even this, uh, the development uh, challenges were even bigger. So this was not something, you know, that uh, Seventy percent of our heritage damage, so it was a big challenge. No, it was, I don't think it was like that. The challenges were more because it was put as a part of uh, national reconstruction, and some of his theories that he was trying to prove, like building back better. I thought this is a sure way to kill heritage, because if you want to say after an earthquake you want to rebuild your heritage better. <laughs> Or you will have awkward, people will be quick and say better in earthquake resistance and not other things. But you have to be, I think that was the big challenge there. So they came up with these kind of slogans. Archaeology came, came with the slogan, Jasta Patashte, Bolyo Prasashte. What I think a very good slogan. It helps both sides, you know. It, uh, it, it takes the engineers in confidence and it has the conservation in confidence also. But then, when you look at the way they are going, you know that this was more of a political statement than anything else. So, PDNA, for example, if you go to the first document, they talk about the problems of mud, wood and brick. <laughs> and one of the major problems would be how to use stronger materials, that's how it is worded in that, like cement. So this, uh, when these things come, and PDNA of course was done by the National Planning Commission and with all the international people, uh, so probably you should believe it. <clears throat> so another massive problem for us was whether reconstruction itself is accepted as a conservation method. Because there, if you are in the field, you will see that there is a, the world does not accept reconstruction as a 
as an authentic reproduction. It is it's very important there when it comes to authenticity. I wrote one article in a recent publication and it said, uh, what can you do with Nepal? Nepal always had this conservation tradition of reconstruction. It's not today. It's since uh, we built it every 200 years, 300 years, and we have been reconstructing it. And so we have this, uh, we have to try to sell uh, uh, this, this, try to raise this to a conservation standard. That was the big challenge. And not many people were going, willing to go for it. And maybe one or two lone voices which were trying to tell to the world that, look, rebuilding is a uh, bona fide means of conservation. Uh, so that, that uh, was also some challenge because the rest of the world did not think that was the way. <clears throat> so this uh, tradition of cyclical renewal, at present you will you will find this word, uh, this phrase being used quite often because this is where Nepal has found a ground for uh, arguing for authenticity through reconstruction. Because for our tradition from 7th century to the 20th century we see that we were doing our heritage on a uh, periodic recycle, uh, periodic reconstruction, periodic maintenance. So this uh, has now become a part of the <coughs> UNESCO's reports. The issue is of money. Money is no issue that people often say this, that we have the money, we can get the money, or people will give us the money. There was the issue of materials. Where will we get the materials to do this? Where will we get the skills to do it? But we just announced it. And then now we kind of quibble that we are building heritage that does not have quality. Because we neither have the money, nor the material, nor the skilled manpower to handle building all of that. <coughs> so, Septium tourism, I already said, within 50, uh, 45 days of the earthquake, we put up signboards on the uh, the squares, two routes this way, that way, this is restricted, this is dangerous area, and as if the people for whom the signboard has been placed don't know how to read it. So if you say this is a dangerous place, please go this way, will the tourists go? Only some I think will go, but that created another problem. So growing community interest was also treated as a problem. Because here, I think the way they were handled, they were being handled as projects that will be contracted and community involvement was not there. And once you don't have a community involvement, what, uh, what uh, can you talk about intangibles? There is nothing intangible. Uh, none, none of the intangibles can come back through the kind of construction process that doesn't involve communities. And communities were, had to be sensitized by people like me. I was, uh, uh, I, I was making noise everywhere, but nobody was listening. And the only group that listened very well was the community. They are the ones who first came and said, look, I made a statement saying that if you want to rebuild your heritage, first thing that you should know is love thy mud, wood and brick. That's what I said. If you don't have a love for your mud, wood and brick, forget about your heritage. Don't talk about rebuilding it. And they are the ones and I'm thankful to them that they actually took it up. And because of that, uh, you know, some of the worst things that could happen did not happen. So, the another big challenge was this, uh, what you call the state party in the World Heritage Conservation is the Department of Archaeology is supposed to be the state party. And that the international party is of course the UNESCO. And state party is responsible for all of those things. But you look at the state party, <laughs> that state of the state party itself was a challenge. They had no architects, they were doing with uh, engineers, and they were archaeology department more uh, uh, able to handle things on the ground than things over it. And their own, uh, you know, the standardized methods has been an issue of, uh, that is not accepted by many people, even today. We are just uh, uh, sometimes it's just tolerating them because there's no other way. So that that uh, reason led to what I think is a domination of the non-state agents. Non-state agents like me, I might have dominated several meetings of archaeology, 
And there are many NGOs who think that they make the rules. That you are it's just there. They would agree. They don't even have to get a permit. Can you imagine? We are rebuilding like this and some other people do not have to get permit from DOA. So those are some of the challenges. And when these people wanted to hide something, they went for what I call the inaugural gallery. Gallery. So you ask your president to come and inaugurate something if you want to hide something. So, you want a Prime Minister to come and do something. Or you want your ex-Prime Minister to come and kind of lay the foundation stone. Where the laying of the foundation stone itself was being challenged. So these were actually challenges to someone. They look like challenges to me because I'm so uh, unhappy with what has, ha ha has happened. So, the DOA caring for its own law, which is supposed to execute the Ancient Monument Act, and you can go and see how they do it. So they are the ones who flaunt it most. You know, I, I said at one time when they were building, this is a long time before earthquake, when they were building Patan Darwar Square, the uh, Patan Museum, we were putting a steel and concrete. If some uh, Mr. Pradhan in front uh, did a house, with steel and concrete, we'll put him to jail. And here was the director general of DOA making a concrete darwar square, and it was going spot free. So I was in one of the meetings where a DSP was attending. I said, Mr. DSP, why don't you arrest this man? <laughs> because he's the one. Because when I asked the expatriate people who were doing it, they showed me a drawing which had a signature of the Department of Archaeology Director. Mm -hmm. That was what he said. Look, I'm doing this, this way. So, that we have to understand this. So, this Ancient Monument Act is kind of uh, used as a ploy. It's not being uh, implemented. And if we actually go to the court with this act, we can get all of these people to the jail. So, in 1833, 1834, we made a selective rebuilding because we did not have the materials and we had to build quickly. When 1934 reconstruction happened, they did not reconstruct some of the temples because they were using material from those temples for salvaging them as salvage to build other temples. So, and some of the things that were left over, we made the new road gate. So, why not? But then, you know, like 10% uh, of the temples in Darbar Square were not built. Not because they were not capable of building, because they didn't want to uh, wait for the new Timbara and other things to come. So they just decided to not do it. So that was, I think, a great policy. It might have reduced the density of monuments, but it certainly uh, enabled our society to come back to the uh, proper footing immediately. So to me, at, uh, at this time, I think we have lost so much of Malayara monuments and particularly the residential architecture, what you call Malayara, not recent, not uh, really built in the Mala times, but following the idioms, architectural idioms of that time, using that architectural language of exposed brick, uh, struts and car windows, etc. So there, I think, we need a very quick decision. We needed it in the beginning of the earthquake. We need it still now. And maybe we'll be needing it after 10 years also. Because nobody is going to make a decision like this. It has to be uh, done. We have to try to decide about this. Which to restore, which to keep, and which not to keep. So that the ambience of the core is not lost. Because that's the only thing that is left as Connor was saying. So, <coughs> So this kind of policy you need uh, as to what to restore and how to reconstruct. Both what to reconstruct and how to reconstruct. Mm -hmm. I think both that policy is needed. For Rana Palace, uh, era buildings we were just talking earlier, I think very sensitively, maybe. Uh, to my thinking, the Rana uh, heritage is not just the royal palaces, uh, the palaces of the Ranas. The palaces of the Ranas are actually government offices at present. 
most of the worthwhile palaces was overtaken by the government and the project of like that. So, so it is this uh, our you know CFPIU and this group is a response. They're just going to float that tender, and the others are going to the collectors are going to take it because they are very valuable. So we have to look about the palaces. Think about some palaces. Maybe think about Charkhavarta, which was an office building of the Rana period. Maybe you should uh, also try to save some of the Gurjuka houses, Gurjuka Bharara. So that was a special architecture. So you have a Raja Kabar, this is Salyani Raja and this Raja. These are the other kinds of Rajas, not the, the Sri Panch, but the other Raja houses. They have their own character. And then you also have Mantrika Ghar, you have this Patan Ghar, you have this uh, 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 Silhana, which we are now just trying our mayor has just decided to widen that road and Silhana is gone. So it doesn't matter if Mathur Singh was there. But you have to, you have, you, this building should be projected not so much for architectural values, but more for historical values, I think. Uh, so I want to, pre if, I, if, you, if I was the one to make a decision, I would like to preserve Jangwari Thapa, Thapa Thali Darbar. I would like to preserve Yunshan Thapa's Bar Darbar. And I would like to preserve Chandra Samsir Srimad Darbar and Srimad Mahal. Some of these are already demolished. Some are being demolished. Others will be demolished. <coughs> so, Kesar Samsir, Kesar Mahal. We want to remember this Ranaji, Kesar Samsir. For? For good reasons. Maybe we want to remember some uh, very bad runner for, for good reason of our history. Uh, he was our runner prime minister. So these are, are the selections. I, I put an Ananda Niketan also because that's where I talk. And this is a, a kind of palace that was given for a public agency. And we restored it long before the earthquake. And as a result, it is able to stand. And uh, uh, so. It's worth uh, conserving because we don't have anything of Bir Samse. Uh, Ananda Niketan is probably the closest that you can get for, from Bir Samse. So is there a strategy? Question number two. I don't know. I have a question. Is the government, does the government have a strategy? Maybe there is no strategy. I proposed the, uh, in uh, 2016 to the Convention of <coughs> Nepal Engineers Association that we should have a strategy that we should have what I call Abhi Navikaran. Abhi Navikaran is Navikaran is of course renewal and AVI is renewal so that authenticity, value and integrity what is, uh, what defines our heritage in, in theoretical terms be preserved. So any Navikaran with that, that could happen a very good strategy and using that strategy maybe you could have a, a two sets of regulations to deal with the Mala era buildings and to deal with the Ran era buildings because they have a different spirit and they have a different material and they have a different technology. Uh, so maybe uh, the, at present, if we take the DOA's guidelines as a strategy, it's the same for everyone. And it is tragical that DOA guideline, although it, DOA doesn't itself follow its own guidelines, Still, it calls for use of lime concrete. It doesn't say mud is bad, mud can be used. If there's one or two sentences which try to say mud is okay, but this is preferred. So everything that we are building now are done in lime mortar. Can you imagine a 10 feet tall uh, stupa that is uh, reconstructed in Soengo is strengthened with uh, lime mortar? A mound is a mound, stupa is a mound. And even mud will make a stupa. We have seen the Patan stupa, which is a earth stupa. It doesn't fail in earthquakes, but engineering knowledge. And this is done by UNESCO. And who authorized UNESCO? Nobody knows. DOA in some lighter moment. As if UNESCO is boss of Nepal's heritage. And some of our consultants are acting as if they are the ones who, who decide. Some of the foreigners are making the decisions for us. And this would hurt professionals like us. Are we not able to make any such decisions? Why don't they ask us? We are not experts. If they have an expertise problem, but they don't do it. 
So we have carpenters posing as structural engineers, and it happens. And that is being supported by international agencies. And so we cannot just be looking at the bright side of this. Some of our international agencies are acting like consultants and rather than advisors to the government. They're using their own money to do their own projects. Can they do that? We don't ask. Because you don't ask, they won't ask you also. So that's the, that's the theory. Okay? So guidelines have been made. Who follows? Does DOA follow? No. Does KBD follow? No. <coughs> Particle municipality? No. BADC, this is uh, Bodha Area Development Committee, does it follow? You have seen the stupa built? No. F this Federation of Central Municipal uh, Management Committee, this also doesn't follow. So nobody follows. So what is the idea? But you know that because they all follow. So how can you follow a guideline which actually encourages replacement of natural materials by uh, industrial materials and technology. And uh, to me, that's no conservation. And some of these experts argue that, oh, there's a st stamp of time needed, the presence of the present and the community. I have also written articles. But whose present are you talking of? Is the present time of the German expert that we want to stamp in our buildings? Or we want to stand in our buildings our own time. The present time of the Nepalese. So that is different to me. That is very, very different. So it cannot be a gold-plated bolt as a stand of time on a steel truss. It has to be something else. So you have to have a stand of time. Heritage is not something that is 10th century and remains 10th century. It has to remain that. It's a reconstruction of 20th century. Okay, some stamp of time. And our, we, we even allowed that. But then exactly what is happening now? If you look at Bauda, Bauda they built it. If you look at that picture, there is something on the top, like a cap. It's not the Trayadas of Bauda. That is somebody just put a tarpaulin over the reinforced, reinforcement that was being put there. Because <laughs> somebody was making noise outside that reinforcements are being used in. <laughs> but that is a very windy area. So there was one time when I went there, the, the winds were <laughs> being the whole the tarpaulin was flying off. And that's how it looks like that. But you could see the reinforcement. So there is a, the whole thing is they have replaced the ERC, which is supposed to be earth tree, the symbol of a, of a stupa. A stupa is a stupa because it has a earth tree in it. And there is no earth tree in this. There is a 12 foot ESC has been in, in, inserted, whereas it doesn't go up. It just ends in your uh, hermica, that is the lower square. So, so what is happening now? We are destroying foundations. Kanak was referring to how the foundation was destroyed in Gunmati, Ratha Machandra. But he did not mention what he did with his monument of southern in, in part of the Arvar square where they raped the whole thing and they destroyed that Navakonda foundation and that's the picture there. That, does that look like a Navakonda? Does it show nine holes? Navakonda means nine pockets. Is that a nine pocket? No, the central pocket, central three pockets have been kind of amalgamated to put concrete for four pillars in the center. So that concrete that. And this was the place where they were, I, I wrote in the press, that can you rest reconstructed architecture by throwing away the entrails of Navar architecture and make it Navar? Is it a, is a reconstruction a bird stuffing exercise? But that's what I So all foundations are being destroyed. We, we learned after this earthquake that our buildings had such good foundations that they had with uh, witnessed several of bigger earthquakes and not been damaged. And our engineers had the audacity to go and declare it as weak and change the foundation. Can you believe it? If you don't believe it, it doesn't matter. They have already done it. <laughs> because we didn't care. But those who cared were kept out. So, earthquake resistance 
to me, our health is earthquake resilient, not earthquake resistant. I, I have a favorite kind of thing. I said, our health is survived by crying with the earthquake. So that was how they absorbed the earthquake energy, by moving. And that's not by resisting, by absorbing. So there is a the bitter neek antique traditional earthquake engineering knowledge. There's a big difference. And to me, that teak traditional earthquake engineering knowledge is also our heritage. And that also has to be preserved. And that is the responsibility of the generation which knows other ways of earthquake resistance building also. And not replace it just like that. So mud mortar and lime mortar, I've already talked about. So all, all the buildings I present are doing lime mortar, and I've seen only one. I think probably KVPG wanted to apologize. In the North Manipanda, they're using the yellow mortar. Yellow mud mortar. So I, I think uh, industrial technology is good for retrofitting buildings like this. The a period building. After all, they are European traditions. They have this European technology already built in. They already have steel beams. They already have reinforcement. They have all, all those things. So there, there's no trouble putting in more industrial things. Uh, but when you do your traditional retrofit of modern uh, mother era buildings, you better do it in, with the natural materials and traditional technology. So another place where we are failing is documentation accuracy and authenticity. These buildings are being reconstructed. If you go to the site, you will see just one elevation is hung, saying the temple of Ratu Mazananath, rebuilding project. And there's a contractor's name and there's an estimate. And you don't even know how that estimate comes about. So there are no details. So that kind of documentation, and I've seen documents written by experts, who said, I, we used a visual judgment to increase the height of this roof. Well, we have got these experts, so that's very nice. Of course, experts were able to use. So I sent a note to some of our experts saying that the way to use your photograph to establish the uh, measurements of a building is there are softwares available in computer. You can feed it the panoramic view of that building from all sides or whatever directions, and that can combine and give you a 3D model. So that actually calculates the height of each and everything. And so if we continue using our expertise to... Uh, expertise how? What expertise? We have been redoing this building for 20 years. This has been built for 1,000 years. So we are so clever. This generation is so clever that it is able to kind of uh, know everything about whatever happened in this culture for thousands of years. I don't believe it. So for us, you, you look at Bauda, maybe symbolism has no value. So, and our heritage is recognized in the world as a faith-based religious uh, living heritage. And if you read the UNESCO's listing criteria, you will know that criteria 3, 4, and 6 have been used here. And one is about faith-based concrete tangible evidence of faith-based civilization. That our temples, our stupas, are tangible evidences of our Badrayana traditions, or our Hinayana traditions, or our Hindu traditions, or Shaktika, or whatever. But this is all about. Now this is the last part, no frustration. The last question. I, I just, uh, this was a question about what do we do about the urban area? I think first thing is uh, we have to see what is urban and where does the urban happen? Does the urban happen inside the temple or inside a stupa or inside your house? No, the urban doesn't happen inside. The urban happens outside. So any urban behavior, urbanization, urbanism or whatever we call it, that is out. That is in the open space, that is in the public space. Because urbanism is living together. It's not living individually. It's not about excellence, it's about social living, it's about uh, living together. So you have to look at the streets and the squares. That's where the urbanism happens. 
And if you want to uh, preserve your city uh, heritage, urban heritage, you have to preserve your streets and squares. Now we have to know that city is a living entity. It ought to change. It will change. It, it, it will change over time. It has to change. We are changing. We are, we are not a 7th century children of Amsuvama. We are 20th century people. So we have our own needs. We, can live, we cannot live behind a TV shop because now we have to read. Those days, yeah, we could uh, go to the farms and carry our children in the carpon and be there. And we are never inside the house in daytime. But now, we have all the time in daytime. And our children have to study. So there is a reason to look at those monuments. So here, when you do talk about urban conservation, I think you've got to be very selective. Selective, which, which time? And you have to think about the people, you have to think about the place, you have to think about the time you reflect. And in case of our heritage, there's multiple time reflected in our heritage sites because we are, uh, like our great mayor's building was saying, we have Vichavi traditions going on, we have Kirath traditions going on. Some of these intangibles are continuing. The tangibles are not there many, but the intangibles are continuing. And that's happening at different times in the same place. So someday we celebrate a Kirath festival in Anandogath. The other day we celebrate the Mala festival. And the next day we celebrate the Saf festival, which is the same place. And it may be with the same people, but with different masks. We come in different ways. Sometimes we come as a lucky, sometimes we come as a goddess. But we do come. And we represent all those things. So you have to be selective. You have to try to find out where are these and what, which of these you want to preserve. Because you can't preserve the whole city. There, there is modern life to be lived also. So how something happens, you have to understand that if you want it to continue. So continuity is not something that is just a kind of physical rebuilding. So intangible rebuilding is difficult, different. So <coughs> maybe uh, sociocultural urbanism is what you want to uh, preserve, not other things. And so when you rebuild the city, think about it. And I thought there are five uh, things I can say if anybody wanted to do it perfectly. Uh, I thought uh, there was someone who wrote that in a Nepalese city, the traditional uh, towns of Kathmandu are like a ballet stage. So, and this was written by a very famous uh, author, uh, and it's like a ballet. So the stage is there, and different actors come from different directions. They know what, the, what time they have to reach. They know someone has to play the flute and someone has to play the drum. And the, the dancer is coming from another neighborhood. But they are coming together at the same time in some place. And that place doesn't have to be notified in the play card. They all know, the society knows. So it's like a big stage, the whole town. It's a big stage and different people come and do different things. So you have to try to save the route. And most of it that survives us today is not those dramatic performances. We, have, we don't get anything from our, on our doublies anymore. But what we do get is the moving processions. Those have somehow survived. We call the chariot festivals or this festival or that festival. That are moving from one point to another. And so save the root is very important. Saving the root. And uh, to do that, you have to save the building footprint. You cannot widen that. The bylaw, the road widening is a sure way to kill this. I, I don't, I'm not saying that the gods have to dance in narrow streets. <laughs> they used to dance for us in very wide places like Tony Hill also. And uh, and uh, I was just telling one of my students yesterday that, that Tony Hill, the name has come because it was called Three Ratma Kyo. There were three jewels who used to come and dance there. So it becomes Three Ratma Kyo. The three, three Ratma Kyo. And Three Ratma are still going and dancing there, but they have been put into a little place. So they just come and kind of uh, go there, make a, a gesture of going there, but come back very quickly to their own place and do their own dances. So these are being squeezed out. And uh, setbacks, really setback, urban heritage. 
So in Harigao, we campaign. We campaign, don't widen the road in Harigao. So finally, we were able to stop it. So the white road ends where the Harigao is supposed to begin to this decision makers. So it's like that. But what they did was, the bylaw, the setback bylaw is being applied. So when you apply a setback bylaw, the building has to move. If you want to reconstruct, you move by one feet, three feet. So road is automatically widening. Now it is like it is, you know, some of the, I, I t tend to think that some of our decision makers are taking a revenge on me. Okay, I didn't wait in your road because you got all these people come and stand in my office. But look, I got this bylaw that I can anyway apply. So this bylaw, and we did not even have the sense to say, okay, we don't widen the roads here, so we don't need to buy setbacks. At least the front setbacks will not have been done. So you go there and you will see all the parties are sticking out in the streets now. Because the buildings, residential buildings are going back by three feet. So this is kind of so setback really sets back the urban heritage. And save the stone on the street. Now I, I put that word because it's not just temples. We because we are carrying some of these intangible traditions from very far back in history, and only those small stones on the streets survive. So in nooks and corners you'll find these little stones that are just sitting there. Some we call gas, some some we put a steel grating over it because the cars have to move and that stone has no value for the, you know, another transport engineer's mind. So we have all these things. So we have some sitting on the building niches or on plinths or some corners which was not needed for turning radius. So it is still sitting there. So we have to save this. And if you save this, maybe the urban heritage is saved. So the third thing you want to save is to save the story. So if you want to do a ballet, you should know your story also. The story is going to soon die because the, 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 the heritage institutions are dying out. Like Gucci are dying out and clan systems are dying out. And now are a highly place specific people. They live in a particular place and that thani we used to call it, right? the man from that place. So there are thanis and non thanis within the same family. The family has decided to stay in their place. And that was important because that's how they relate to all this. Intangibles is related to the place. And that's why we have a great service of intangible culture. So somehow you have to try to save this story. All the knowledge about maybe the Lake story we have to document. Maybe Machana story we should document before we start stopping some of the activities because we can't do them anymore. So already we are doing a lot of things. There, I, I remember uh, in one of our chatras in Harikam last year, they put a, for the chariot, they put a steel, uh, this thing, hangers. Because it's, you know, so if, if we put it by tire, tire by rope, it takes us a long time. <laughs> so you just make a round thing and you put your bamboo across, fine, it does the job. And boys are happy. But what a silly way to kill your own tradition. So you have to uh, save our tradition, you have to save what I call the dramatist personnel. If I try to carry the chariot, I don't carry it well. Because I don't have the sense of carrying it. I don't feel like there is a quad on inside. But there are groups which feel it. And so these are the dramatic personnel of the Dalai. That they feel, they can emotion, emote themselves to that situation. And when the chakras are done, if you watch, you can see the kind of emoting that the people are able to do. Next day they will be going to their office in their motorbikes. But today, they are carrying that chariot. And uh, unfortunately we see the Leviathans and some, you know, uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, European Union t-shirts. Sometimes you have US government hacks because all our donors want their names to be displayed. Uh, so you can see the Chatra has become a donor's field because we have been habituated to go and ask for money, even when we don't need it.
when you can do something with a, a flimsy yellow cap, why do you want to uh, go for a, you know, British hat? I don't know. That's a sure way of killing your story. So lastly, save your stage. If you don't have the stage, then you don't know where to go and perform. So these five things that you do, I think your organizers will be saved. Thank you very much. Thank you. The last part was not my frustration. The last part is my recommendation. And everybody tells me that when I speak, I'm always critical of everyone. Don't proffer solutions. Well, I can't proffer solutions because solutions are to be given by professionals. And I'm just a critic, I'm just a teacher. And I want to learn from what people have done. And I would like to, if they are not doing it right, I'd like to say, this is how it should be done. Thank you, most of you are the Thank you, Prof. We want to test the Prof. So, Rajesh, uh, where are you? How long we have before we are done for lunch? 20 minutes. OK, so the floor is open. So, this whole notion of me and Sudarshan has kind of twisted it to make it thick. So we have a clash of me and teak. So what I want to convey to the audience is this. I think most of you are architects. I think there are a few of us who are engineers. And this whole presentation, there has been a bifurcation between the engineers and the architects. This is whole reconstruction process cannot occur without the combined effort and the understanding between the architect and the engineer, and especially heritage restoration cannot. Okay? I need to respond because I don't think that me kind of take is an opinion thing. It's not an opinion thing. And our gentlemen, I think all of us should be that we, while he was speaking, he was putting the onus of verification on teak and onus of verification not for me. Meek is okay with the formula, just because the formula is given, that's fine, you don't have to verify. But tick, he says, should be verified. I'm very happy that uh, the joint use of these uh, methods are being suggested, but my own advice would be, don't put in a foreign thing into it. Because we have seen what's happened. You have you go to Anuman Dhaka, where they put, uh, John Sandy put in, uh, uh, 1979, they put a ring beam in Lojo with some concrete beams. And in this earthquake, one of the concrete beams snapped. And like a knee jerk, our two top floors of the, uh, the uh, Naukale Darwar tumbled down. And we blamed the earthquake for it. That is the only building which crashed on the northeast direction, whereas all the others have crashed on the southwest. Everybody had fallen on the southwest, only that had fallen northwest. But I just wanted to say that that failure was simply due to John Sandy's introduction of the so-called Nick, this uh, uh, reinforced concrete. And you might have seen in, in Pachan, you saw the, and right now they are reconstructing this, uh, the Radha Krishna temple, which was done by KV Pichi long time ago. And when it fell to the ground, you might have observed that all our other temples fell down as if their claws were being kind of dismantled, so they fell down like this. So it's so that just shows that it is joint failure. It's not they were not stiff, they were just crashing down. But this one, two top floors of Radha Krishna temple flew flew some distance and overturned. And you had the lower floor, upper floor sitting down, and, the, and it was on the street for several days before it was decided. How can a Nepalese architect's building crash 30 feet away and two floors going together? Because those are the two floors they had restored. The third, the lower floor had not been restored. And you can go and look at. Uh, the, the reconstruction now that's going on in, in Batsala Temple in uh, Bhaktapur. This was also done by Mr. John Sandy in 1979. 
Some of the money they saved from Anman Doka was used there. This was UNESCO's gift to us. So what they did was, at that time, that temple had some people tree growing in it. So they cut some of these. And maybe left some things intact. And they injected lime concrete to consolidate. So you consolidated it. So what happened? The next earthquake came and you had a heavy head sitting on top. So our lines flew some distance. So I got some pictures of it if you want to have a look. How four of the lines of Basara temple, how far they fell down. And you can still see what pieces of stone fell down. The consolidated dome just flying out. Now I'm not saying that it would not have collapsed if it, was, it had not been consolidated. But our whole system of uh, brickwork and temple building is reducing the large mass into smaller masses. So that's why when you make your wall also, you put your timber ties every three feet. Because there is some advantage to be gained by if you can uh, re reduce the mass action at that time. And this consolidation has done it. And I can cite many other cases where incompatibility, and we have a great uh, uh, innovation that were done in uh, Gopinath and so you would be surprised, some of our uh, international exports have been very quick in restoring some of the buildings compared to our general pace. Have you ever asked why that happens? Because there was a need to hide something, cover up something very fast. <laughs> Otherwise things will be seen. So some damage that was essentially caused because of asymmetries that were introduced in the name of strengthening. These were symmetrical structures and they introduced during renovation some asymmetries. They just put a, a steel tie in one direction. And it is in this direction that the whole wall got punctured and cracked. But uh, these are, I mean, if you have good engineering, of course, might have avoided this. It's not good looking. No, no, but no, let's not into that. But I'm sorry that uh, I have to say this because I feel very strongly about it. And I, I'm uh, very, uh, I mean, I'm open to say that I'm frustrated about it. And maybe some of these comments are uh, comments of what somebody called a frustrated professor of Institute of Engineering. <laughs> so. Thank you, Professor uh, Tiwari. Now, quickly. I'm not going to go Insensitive by us, set back with an abelian for Bukura, Yama Hari, and a Sari to Hari. You say, by the insensitive Avena, set back insensitive Avena, building for Vincent. I mean, engineer, architectural insensitive Avago, planner insensitive Avago. But I'm the institution of insensitive Avago. Call it Paragos and Nepali architecture to an earthquake septic at traditional detailing. Insensitive application of building codes. And not, I'm not actually saying the building code is insensitive. And this happened in Pachan, when uh, Pachan was the first city to try to apply this building code. That is the experience from there that I'm saying. That when, as engineers, when you're sitting and applying a building code, that building code did allow, of course, continuity of the heritage tradition also. But you, uh, you know, the, the engineers or the municipality was implemented it, wanted uh, the code number two to be used because the submission requirements are like that. You have to submit your calculations and this and that if your house is more than 1,000 square feet. And so that is, that's why I said insensitive application and set back, uh, sets back heritage in streets where I said you have to be selected and uh, you do that. Thank, thank so you, Professor Now Dubai. I think for heritage. Saros. Uh, yes, uh, I think, uh, it searches for the roots of the place that we live in. Uh, just one statement which uh, I'd like you to uh, kind of respond is that you said that preserve a good Rana building because of the bad they did, the Ranas did. 
In this, I would like to just kind of know which is the root, the good building or the bad they did. Thank you. Industries also. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the runners may have cheated on us. Like the for building that house, where did that get that money? Because of our, through our impoverishment, they got that money. You know, How? We, we look at architecture, sometimes the architecture that we see, we just kind of understand it from, you know, it's a nice building, we can house the uh, offices now, but does it really represent us? Uh, no, I, well, I can call it post-Victorian. But one of the things about Rana buildings, uh, particularly palaces in Nepal, is that this quality of uh, neoclassical architecture was achieved by those workmen who did not know about plaster, who were always uh, using wood and uh, brick. Actually, a builder was that. And so when you look at these Rana palaces, if you look at it in detail, you'll find that the Gothic, uh, you know, the, 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 the orders, and if you say that there's a Corinthian order, and you go and look at the Corinthian column itself, the first few buildings of the Rana, the Corinthian column was ordered from Sefid. Then Sefid, they cast it, they brought it and screwed it on here. So most of our Bisham uh, Sefid were built on that way. But later on, immediately after that, they didn't have to do that because Nepalese craftsmen learned how to make it, how to work with the plaster and get that design out. But in the process, also introduced their own you know, aesthetics. So there are a lot of details here, if you look at it, which is not uh, really uh, European. The, the, the Nepalese side has come in. So these were built by Nepalese. And actually, uh, I, I mentioned that I would like to preserve Jamba the Runners Thakhari Palace, because the person who built it was not, the, even the engineer was not used from Europe. For that, the uh, Niger was a Nepali Niger, and he was engineer and he was able to. Okay, thank and you. No design was going to be. Devanji, Devanji, quickly. Very short one. And after that, boy, go. Right? Don't make me just define what I say, because I, I don't know to define what I say. And that is, those are my emotions, those are my feelings. I will still have Very good. Thank you. You have emotions. So you express everything by emotion. That's what we want. The first thing you said, your view express your frustration. Usually to say that genius are not happy with what's happening in the world, yeah? So that's one part. But be, uh, remember that architects of your age, architects of your age, of, I said, of our age, my age, uh, the more older they are getting, they are more being frustrated. That's a phenomenon in Nepal. So let's put it aside. Yeah? Uh, yeah, but you can play well. But first thing, <laughs> and you said after the earthquake, the first thing the government I didn't use my full time for the earthquake. The first thing uh, you said that uh, the artists were alienated yeah, from the whole process. Uh, we have been working in Sona, we have been working with Nepalese artists from the very beginning. So can you just tell us your observation? Why it happened like that? Was there any uh, shortcomings in the part within us? And then uh, now why is happening? Yeah, yeah. No. So you your analysis. And then other things that you said the city core happens is intact. Yeah. Now if we talk about only buildings, now buildings, buildings and buildings make such uh, system of buildings. Now if this yeah. this in every building is treated the way you have observed it. So how that sticker and brings will be stored? Please, please. No, that's fine. If we, uh, I'm not uh, arguing that everything should be made traditional. Okay? So that's why I said we've got to have different codes for residential buildings and monumental buildings. Monumental buildings are monuments. They're called monuments because they carry a memory of a monument, a memory of a moment in history. That's why they become monument. And when you look at that monument, who tells you that moment? That the mon monument has to be able to tell your story. Otherwise, otherwise we need books, right? At least for Nepalese, we say in heritage, heritage, cultural heritage, to the fellow within that culture, no books have to be written because that's already there. So, so you have to. Uh, what I was suggesting was for residential houses, you you try to. 
preserve the core area or you, have, you select what you want to preserve and then you give the standard because I also said that living in the modern age, you are inside that house. So they might need more light, they might need more height, they might need many things. And they might be in a healthier building, they might be in a more ventilated building. And somehow I think reconstructions have to be able to introduce this. Thank you. Baini, what is your question? After that, you. No, no, you're Baini, Baini, let me try that. Uh, we can uh, timber uh, issue one more time. It's true that we are not doing enough um, um, research on our own traditional materials. Perhaps I'm also guilty of that. The other thing, the challenge we are against uh, mud, using mud, is um, we are against cement. And I've heard some of our own colleagues probably saying that Nepal is now um, independent of um, cement production. We are, we yeah, don't have to. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure what that means, but you know, that's what we are up against. And cement advertisements are probably the marketing of cement, and uh, probably the only second to talk about ads in the TV. Thank you, Wayne. So the other point is also that our laws are against it as well. But we are not, we cannot build, at least in the pattern, we cannot build with much water buildings anymore. And the bank or the valuation of Mud contract buildings comes under Kotsi building, Kotsi so which has absolutely no value. So what they're doing is waiting for the um, the building to collapse so they can build it, and that again goes goes back to the red stickers. People are actually asking for the red stickers because they can demolish their houses. Thank you. They have to do politics, uh, and you know, like that's how they are able to uh, kind of estimate the demolition cost uh, of uh, Sima Mahala three crores and they get a bid for 8 crores and the engineer thinks it made a profit of 5 crores for the government but they forget that something which was 30 crores was evaluated as 3 crores and there was probably a play of uh, some 22 crores somewhere so these kind of things happen the mud motor I, I'm talking about is the engineer sitting at the back who, who uh, are probably more conversant with this but I have heard that this research has been done not by Nepalese, even Nepalese are now doing it. We have done some in Institute of Engineering itself, and now we have just published some of the data on strength of motor. And one of the latest publications says it has to have one MBA, uh, which is uh, fair enough for uh, uh, two or three building, uh, story buildings, maybe. And there are some studies that have shown up to two point something uh, MBA for uh, uh, motor strength also. The Chinese have done it, Chinese have even demonstrated on the shaking table and invited Nepalese engineers to go and have a look at the results of that. And so they were trying to, uh, they were modeling uh, building in my motor. So there is an interest, as an academic interest, but it is not academicians who will implement this thing. So we have one person, we have practitioners who are saying that, look, oh, yeah, it's good for you to say this thing, but you are a researcher, you can do the research and you tell us. But I'm not a researcher, so I don't do any research. So I do from my formula. So these kind of uh, uh, practitioners are uh, with us, so that they have they have been uh, more damaged into it. So uh, modern motor, I think, uh, probably will come back because I'm very uh, happy that KPT has decided to put modern motor back wherever they can. So uh, this is a good way. And modern motor is not, uh, you know, the mud from the backyard, uh, mixed with sand and uh, uh, garbage and everything. That is a a certain uh, combination of sand, silt, and clay, these are mixed together, and if you vary the mix, you can get very many kind of properties. I have, I have some, looked at some research done in Tibet by Chinese engineers who were doing research on this mortar and roof finish on Potala, and they have done uh, many research into which material can be added to mud or the traditional material to increase their. Uh, you know, waterproof uh, properties or to improve their tensile properties or whatever properties you want. So if you are intended to do research, you can do it. But here we are a funny country, you know. We are rebuilding our whole heritage with the uh, bricks ordered from Karai. And these are supposed to be Dachiyaba kind of things. And what Dachiyaba we have? We, we have what we call uh, weeping Dachiyabas. What I call weeping Dachiyabas. They, they use these uh, colors that come from Calcutta and make it look like Lachiapa and one period of rain and you see them oh. kind of tears rolling down. She has something to uh, about cement also. 
products and then so that uh, that happens here with us i know we have we have heard many things like that and we are supposed to be self sufficient in cement somebody told me and i was talking to a conservation architect who was working in bhaktapur and they dismantled one building and in that in the construction of that building there was a special clay used that clay is called the kosi uh very good uh, pancha okay pancha that that's the elephant that is used in the test that's that's of the granite and name for it it's not a never name it, it uses never terminology but kosi pancha uh, and this is so i said why don't you use it it's one of my students so i can't use it because it's only available in that hill and it's not available you can go to korea to buy whatever you need but you can't go to a bigger <laughs> uh farm there so some people like uh, i think in india i i recently saw uh, a woman uh, making the clay mortar there and i was very pleased like oh this is uh, really nice that somebody is making a mortar in the traditional way you know using feet foot and making it uh, over three days and it's not just one one moment that you prepare the clay but we have uh, you know we have these guidelines it says Land concrete has to be prepared over four days and rested for seven days, and then one it will gain strength. But for mud mortar, they will say it can be used for two-story building, but they don't know. They don't say anything about its strength or what is the process of making mortar, what is the content of it. But you have your traditional architects of books if you look the manuscripts. You will say if you want to make brick, take soil from such and such places and put them together. These have been specified, and we all think that is a old woman's story. <laughs> but it is very much of a scientific thing that they were looking at the chemical composition of the ingredients before you mix it so for mortar there was uh, some statements there so unfortunately we are a civilized modern nepal you know so cement is cement <laughs> thank you professor the last question which has become in recent years in nepal yeah. uh, our pune it is could have been one analyzed or there are so many factors to it and our particular one that really i mean architecture is necessary for us also to save the new uh, identify new heritages identify right now so that the future generation will learn from it so till i can possibly identify god in the video so i will get there thank you <laughs> not my question but and some uh, there are process uh, anything becomes uh, any modern things can become heritage we talked about something there i think uh, gogolji was referring to um, uh, lekhan's building so uh, there are many many i am in mean, uh, some of these uh, uh, palaces might be our heritage i when i talked about shimla darbar uh, to this uh, a, a group of uh, government officers why it is a heritage and why it should not be built the thing i cited was that let's not think of shimla darbar as just chandra samsher's palace some such a thunder some such a office because it, it, in the very beginning of Sima Darbar the first prime minister of our federal republic of Nepal took his oath there and that should be important for history so you can mark the spot you can make put the chair back there and you can say when your dignitaries come from look this is the chair and this is the place that is if our federal uh, system succeeds as to succeed we have to take pride of these things no and that's how we create historical value uh, for you know for future for future children to remember our history and that's our values are created so we can create many values we are uh, talking around here uh, not not recently i was in another seminar where we were talking about <coughs> lakshmi jayanti and lakshmi prasad and why lakshmi prasad houses being just left over while Uh, in England, you find sex pairs even footprints being saved and kind of sewn around with a red circle. So that's how heritage heritage becomes once you uh, give value to it. So I once attended a seminar in Denmark about the you know this was uh, uh, this was uh, called uh, um, uh, you know the memory using memory. as a heritage building tool for example the case site at there was that for example we might remember london one part because that's where my last pound was gone or so we might have a memory of that place 
you know, this is where I was penniless. <laughs> and something happened and it became history for you. So when you go back there, that's the point you cherish because that's the point you remember. Or this is the restaurant I went with my girlfriend in the, my first visit. <laughs> so this becomes heritage. This becomes the memory. And people are doing that. And that later becomes heritage because if the whole society wants to keep that memory and not just individuals. Thank you, Professor Tiwari. <laughs> And this was your postponed it. Monday is like last point. I was going to go to the hospital. I was going to go to the hospital. I was going to go to the hospital. I was going to save it for the next uh, earthquake. So that's the question. My answer is very simple. Cyclical renewal. Our people knew that grass will grow on a roof yeah. which is laid on mud. So, every year, they, they had a festival to go off the roof ah. and check out the grass. You don't do that. You don't do that. We put a water faucet in our toilet and it doesn't work after five years or maybe five days and we don't know how to maintain it. But this was a culture which made a water conduit in the 5th century and it was running till the 20th century when the Nepalese learned of some new knowledge systems and they knew how to kill it. Thank you, Professor Tiwari. Give him. Thank you for our uh, keynote speakers um, and also Bharat Sarma sir uh, for uh, being a good moderator. Um, uh, moving forward with this uh, program, uh, I would like to call upon architect Anjumala Prada to distribute the token of appreciation. To be a speaker. Few minutes, you know. I, I don't have to add anything. Uh, I think this uh, session has been really pretty, pretty good and food for thoughts and it provides us a lot of, you know, inertia to think about it. We as a professional, whether we are doing our duty or not, SONA as an as a institution, whether it's doing its work or not, or even the journalists like Karnak Dichim, whether they are doing their job or not. So, you are somebody like Hasgazako, Sesan Bakosa, or Bires Bailai, more direct than the Badinsu. You concept develop Gorera, your technical session like Bonacata Karatira, Warne Warera Suteko, Sona, Warne Parera, Juruka Utahoki, or Sabahan. For our second keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Sudarshan Rastivari, who is the Please uh, give him a round of applause for a great So they have been asking why I never came up for 25 years. It's because of the design.